Hello everybody, James here. Story time with Dutch Mantel, episode 72. Dutch, do you know why I say the episode number every single week? Uh, no, I do not. Please enlighten me as well as those fans that we have listening, all 12 of them. Yeah, be- because uh, I don't actually, when I make the video file, I never actually write what number it is. Mm-hmm. So if I say it right at the beginning of every single episode, ah, it's 72. Perfect. That's why I do. Oh, good. Yeah, I think that's clever. Good thinking. I think that's pretty clever. You, you, you're thinking ahead. All right, I got my cigar out, so I'm ready to talk some wrestling. Mm, uh, should we do the plugs first while you gnaw away? <laughs> <laughs> I don't gnaw away at this. I just put it there. and You know, I do like to, I do like to smell a cigar. Mm. I don't really like this. I, I do smoke them sometimes, like once in a blue moon, but I'd rather smell the cigar. What flavor is oh, it? Yeah. Well, this is a kind of an old cigar. It's probably uh, a drawer smell now, <laughs> but, but but actually it, it smells pretty good. All right, so what, what episode are we on? We're on episode 72, and for the 72th time, uh, in this show, I'm going to let you. I'm going to let you. Seventy, do the seventy <laughs> tooth. That is funny. Yeah, I, yeah, I said it. I'm going to have to write it down. That's that's kind of funny. Speaking of writing, okay. you've written before, yeah. haven't you? You've written a couple of books, haven't you, Dutch? I have written a couple of books. They're right here behind me. For those who would like to imbibe in my books, and I even pick them up every now and then, and I'll actually read some. Some great stories, like when I wrestled the bear. That's probably one of my my best stories. And I write about Puerto Rico, and I write about riots, and I talk. I I write about Japan, and I was in Japan once, and I went over there, and it was the beginning of this shoot era. And, you know, a lot of those promotions, and I didn't know this about 10 years ago, they're owned by the mafia. See, the mafia go to these towns and they don't sell tickets. They will take a ticket to a a, a business and say, here's 10 tickets. When we come back, we want them sold. Well, if they don't sell, guess who, guess who buys the last ticket? Mm-hmm. The vendor, he mm-hmm. buys them. And so when they go pick the, and, and they own the show. But they didn't like the way that certain matches looked choreographed. So, and these Japanese guys, they spoke no English. So when you went out there, all they did was just beat the living crap out of you. They would chop you, and my God, I've been in easier street fights, really. So I was over there one one time with Scott Casey from Texas. I came back after a match one time. I went, damn, these guys can't work with a shit. And he went, what? He said, what are you talking about? I said, hell, the guys just are a real stiff. He said, this is a high shoot group. I says, well, Terry, Terry Funk booked me. I said, Terry didn't tell me that. He says, well, does he got to tell you anything now? I said, well, no. So from that point on, I went out there and I, I kind of got a little rough with them, and hell, they loved it. You know, it, it's hard to go into a match in Japan, and they're really beating the crap, kicking you hard. I mean, it was it was down near three quarters of a shoot. You know, they kicked me hard; I'd kick them back. Didn't phase them. It was you know, it was kind of phasing me a little bit. <clears throat> so when I chop them back, they go harder, harder. I went. Brother, that's all I got. I can't hit you no harder. I'm hurting myself. I hit one guy one time. I hurt my hand. Then I punched him in the head. He did. They didn't care. And then they go from like fire breathing dragons in the ring back to the dressing room, and it's like they underwent a personality change. They get in the back and they go, "Oh, thank you, thank you very much." I go, "What the hell is weird?" It's like. I don't know. It was like a, a twilight zone, and and, and I, I can't explain it, but but because the mafia guys, you know, they didn't want anybody to tell them all oh, that that didn't look real. So 
we had to go out there and beat the crap out of each other to satisfy them. So they would, all the mafia guys, <clears throat> you could tell them they all had, all had sunglasses on, the kind of short, well, Japanese is kind of short anyway, and they would have a finger missing. Mm -hmm. Then I'd see another, and he'd have a finger missing. I'm like, what the hell was this? What are they working in a sawmill or what? Or were they working in a butcher shop? So I asked somebody, I said, not to be inquisitive, but <laughs> <laughs> why do some of those guys in those black suits and sunglasses, they have finger missing? He says, oh, oh, a finger missing mean uh, a screw up. If F up, you fuck up. It's if he screws up, they cut a finger off. And then if he screws up again, they cut another finger off. I saw one guy with three fingers on one hand and one on the other. <laughs> I said, boy, he must have been a real fuck up because mm -hmm. he screwed up. Pretty soon he wouldn't have any fingers. And they would just cut him from here down. They would leave the... They'd leave the top part of the finger there, but but anyway, it was it was a different existence. So, what were we talking about? I was going to say it's probably why you don't see any like banjo plays in the yakuza. <laughs> yeah, or you know, fiddle, you know, <laughs> our fiddle players, you know, and that's probably why they have a lack of bluegrass <laughs> bands in the country because you just don't see them over there. No, I. So, so go ahead. What were we talking about? Oh, oh other, the, the, other bluegrass. Well, uh, uh, the lack of uh, Japanese bluegrass is. I was going to say, if you want more stories like that, you go to. If you, in fact, actually, if you want to have the books unsigned, you go to Amazon dot whatever it is, whatever country. And if you want them signed, you email Dirty Dutch Mantel with two L's at gmail dot com, and you make your request there. Same for the University of Dutch Diplomas. I have two books as well but they're somewhere else i can't be bothered to get them the rock and owen hart you know where they are the links from the description i've been flogging them for long enough and you know they're in the background all the time you can't miss them great gift for christmas now uh, oh yeah uh, i've got a weekly podcast with shane douglas franchise university with shane douglas shane douglas official on youtube and that's doing very well and it's climbing climbing up the ranking slowly but surely but you know we've, how could it not there yes i would i would listen to it have you listened to it? No. No. All right. Right. So we need you could listen to it, and then that'd be one more listener. Hey. Oh, well, I'll I'll subscribe. How about that? That will do me just fine. Thank you very much. Right. Uh, hey, whether a... you listen, whether you listen to it or not, folks, just subscribe. We just need a number. We're trying to get to a hundred thousand, which is the magical number on YouTube. Correct. Mm -hmm. That's when the first little trophy is. Yeah, we get yes. our first trophy. Next and one's notice, a million, so I don't think we're going to be getting to that anytime soon. Well, how many does Cornette have? 300 and something thousand? Yeah, it's towards 350, 400, something like that, yeah. That's ridiculous. I know. We're currently, as we record, oh, not stupid Chrome for some reason. It's not loading YouTube properly. 96,724 subscribers as we record this. Wow. You know, we have mo we've moved like 5,000. In about six weeks, mm, maybe that's actually. Oh, I know so. Mm. I'm a I'm a counter. I know, I know. You've been there. I've, you've been telling me this recently. You've been keeping more of an eye on it. You've been getting your little monocle out and really peering at the numbers every every week or every day. Yeah, like this. Mm. I got it. <laughs> I will do okay. it. Okay, we'll do it. We've got news. Many newses. <sighs> we used to. Uh, we used to do like different kind of subjects every. I've realised this. We we're gonna have to go back to doing that sometime. But there's been so much news these last few weeks, so we've basically been doing episodes just purely based on the news. And in mm -hmm. fairness, the views have been doing fantastic from it. So I think we'll probably stick with this at least for a little bit longer. But if we get time after all the news has been read out, we're gonna do a bit on WCW when you joined WCW in 1990. But for now, uh, I gave you a load of news, but you wanted to speak a couple of things as well. One was on you Jerry. Know Talking about WCW, you know how I got there, right? No, I was. I, that's I had the first to offer. I had to offer to. I had. I. I said I'm going to sue you. 
What? And what was the name? Heard? What was yeah. his name? Jim Heard, yeah. Jim Heard. Yeah. I got him on the phone and I said, hey, you going to book me or not? He went, well, this, that, and the other. I said, no, that's not, that's not the question. I said, if you don't book me within the next two weeks, you're going to have a certified letter coming on your desk, and I'm suing you guys. He said, for what? I said, well, first of all, not keeping your word for one thing, which wouldn't have been enforceable. It's my word against them. But I got booked. They called me up and said, well, here's your start date. Because he said he was going to book me, and I was somewhere else, and I gave my notice, and then they didn't book me. We, which is which is standard operating fare for a lot of wrestling companies back in those days. He didn't know that. Uh-huh. So when I said, I'm going to sue you, he didn't want a lawsuit on his desk because <clears throat> they're going to have to do something with that because, you know, TBS is a business. They don't like that stuff lying around. So the easiest thing for him to do was just give me a job. And I did. We will. Uh, I, we'll, I stayed there about two years. Yeah, we're hopefully going to get to that uh, if we get through all this news. We're probably going to skip a couple of things as well. You did want to okay. bring up uh, the first thing was Jerry Lawler. Uh, there's another recent mm-hmm. photo of him out. Well, another recent photo. I think WWE went to Memphis three weeks ago, not too long ago, yeah. and he came over there. And what they did, they introduced him to the crowd. And he walked out just like where the entrance is for the guys. And you see it on Raw and SmackDown. I think this was a SmackDown, maybe. Raw that he came out. A Raw, okay. Yeah, he was during the break. And, yeah, and they introduced him. And he got a a pretty good ovation. But he was he looked different because he had grown like a, a goatee. And it was solid gray, which it should be anyway. But it looked like it was a little bit of gray that was kind of manufactured. But it was short, and it, and it actually looked good on him. So he looks good. And But I have heard that he will probably never, never, never do any more commentary on Raw or any wrestling show because he still has trouble – Speaking, and the thing about Lawler, he was, he had that quick wit and he was, he could get it out and he could laugh and, but I don't think he can do that anymore. This last stroke almost, almost got him. Hmm. So I, I'm glad it didn't goes. And this is, this was his third stroke. I don't know how many strokes God gives you, but he's had three of them. So he's, he's used up quite a bit. So, but Jerry, if you're listening, which you're not, I know you're not. So if anybody sees Jerry, tell him that uh, James and I said hello and we're pulling for him. Uh, the second thing you wanted to bring up was Dave Meltzer. Have you ever been blocked by Dave Meltzer? No. Never? N- not yet, as far as I know, no. I might be able to. Well, I, I might soon be. You Depending ain't you shit. Think. You you not crap in the rest of business <laughs> unless Dave Meltzer has blocked you. And Dave Meltzer has blocked me. I think he blocked me like two years ago. And the reason was he made some offhanded comment about something and didn't know what he was talking about. And I kept putting on his on his uh, Twitter message line or whatever it is that he didn't know what he was talking about. And he wanted to argue back and I was arguing back and because I was right. And he just blocked me just out of the clear blue. So unless you've been blocked, I sent you a picture of it. Yeah, in case you wanted to use it. Uh, unless you've been blocked by Amoser, you're not crap in the rest of the business. <laughs> so, and I, I I wear that as a badge of honor. Now, do you think that Tony Khan's going to block us at some point fairly soon? Because that nah. was our first big bit of news. Nah, nah. <sighs> hell oh. no. 
it's one of those things where we always do it. We record the podcast, send it out, and then a few hours later, something really big and newsworthy happens, so we have to wait like a week to refer to it. But <laughs> Tony Khan went on a Twitter or X, or whatever it is. Do you still call it tweeting? Or do you call it Xing now? How does that work? I must still call it Twitter. Because mm. people know what it is. Yeah. It, it doesn't, wait a minute. It doesn't sound right when you go, I'm going on X. What the? I mean, if somebody said it to me, I, I'd, I'd have to think about slapping them. I wouldn't slap them <laughs> or anything. But, but, but Twitter is not as good as it used to be to me. I don't know why. Have you noticed a change in it? Well, I always hated it. I never, Did I, you? I, yeah, I, I never use it. I don't use any social media really. Why? Wow. Because I've got no interest in how? talking to people how? or seeing other people. What they're up to. Well, how are you going to get people to talk about you? That's a good point. That's why I've got one. So very occasionally, <laughs> so very occasionally, I'll just I'll try and post something to drum up interest for the podcast, or whatever, and then I just mm-hmm. I have no interest again. I just really? I've never understood Twitter. I understood Facebook to a point, and then I'll tell you what I did was I have a Facebook that I follow nobody on. So every single friend I've got on Facebook, I've unfollowed them. I've unfollowed everything. So now there's no reason for me to go on Facebook unless someone direct messages me. And that's why I do it. So it's only good to have direct messages. Because I'm one of those people who will get sucked into the scrolling for two hours and and then I don't remember anything that I've seen kind of thing. It's just a waste of time. You know, wrestling will kind of drain your brain. Mm. It, it really will. All right, give me the give me the Tony Khan news. Well, uh, we refer to it somewhat after the NXT Dynamite head to head battle that Dynamite lost, like something like six hundred thousand to nine hundred thousand to NXT. Anyway, we referred to one of his tweets, but then after we stopped recording, there was a load more that came out, and some of these are interesting. There's a bit of a writing and reading, so bear with me. Uh, <clears throat> replying to a fan who's talking about why Vince uh, has got the right to talk as a billionaire wrestler's owner over Tony Khan for whatever reason, uh, Tony replied, yes, Vince has allegedly used his power and influence to shoot a lot of shots. Then, soon afterwards, he writes the following. This is Tony Khan. This week, two active decades-long rating streaks from two great legends were ended with all due respect... Until this week's head-to-head AEW on TBS versus WWE on USA, neither John Cena nor Undertaker had ever been on a WWE show with under 1 million total viewers plus under 400k in the demo. And now, keep in mind at this point that the ratings obviously were already out, and then Tony fires this out as a great big pile of sour grapes. I don't get it. Why is he saying under... A million. That's that's like a backhanded slap. It's not those two. It's not even backhanded. It's saying <laughs> I don't it's front handed. It's open palm yeah. slap. Yeah. To say, hey, you had all these guys, you didn't get a million. Mm-hmm. Even though he had a load of guys and he barely scraped six hundred thousand. <laughs> I don't think see, I think when you start talking ratings, I think that that goes over the head of most fans. I don't even hardly read it because that's for them to talk about. I don't give a crap. Again, I'm going to say this. I think as far as AEW and WWE having a war, when you have a war, both sides have to know there's something going on. But in that case, WWE didn't, they don't even acknowledge AEW. They don't even acknowledge them. Even when they didn't they move a show one time, WWE moved the show to keep from going head to head with the AEW. Yeah, that was NXT from Wednesdays to Tuesdays. Okay. And TNA, it's the same thing when TNA was in existence. WWE didn't even didn't even acknowledge that TNA was there. So they if did. a war goes on, you have to have two competing sides. And both of them have to know that a war is going on. You're fighting each other. So the first week in TNA, when TNA went live on Monday against Raw, mm-hmm. and they had to think that was the one with Hogan and Bischoff coming yep. out. Do you know what WWE scheduled? And they definitely did know there was a war on. Not that it was a war, but they definitely did want to sort of put a stamp on that, was I think they booked the return of Bret Hart for that. Mm-hmm. 
So it's not like that. In a way, they're taking the war not seriously, but in a way, they're definitely booking as if there is a war for one week. And then yeah. after that, they didn't book anything special at all because TNA couldn't. Okay, let's it. go. TNA, they still lost the lost that first head to head. Oh, badly. And then they the and then back. it was worse every week for TNA to the point that they were pulling in like point fives. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I had a good idea for that. They didn't want to do it. I think. Uh I think we needed to accent our girls more in TNA because that's what paid the bills. Uh, once I got Amazing Kong, Awesome Kong going, Gail Kim going, people were really, really interested in that. My sister, who is not even a wrestling fan, she watched it one night and she saw Awesome Kong just beat the crap out of some other girl. And her grandson was watching the wrestling one night and she come in and she says, has Kong been on? She said, she, she's coming up next grandma. Okay. And she said, she sat down during the awesome Kong match and watched the whole match. And when awesome Kong was done, she got up and she said, well, I've seen what I want to see Bye." And mm -hmm. she just went, went about her deal, but the girls, they turned the number. Uh, in the early days of of TNA. And I, I've written this down because I said, why don't we do with the girls like we do with the guys? Instead of just being, you know, candy, eye candy for just guys, let's, let's have them compete. And all those girls wanted to compete. I will say that. Those girls go out there and they worked hard. That Kong, she put them through the paces. They put her through hers. And when we finally went up, and I've said this before, with uh, we put the main event on some show. We give them the last 30 minutes of our weekly show, TNA Impact, give them the last 30 minutes. And they did a, a 3.4 during that time, which really raised, raised our uh, whole viewing uh, number up to over a three. Mm -hmm. We were doing about a for the whole show mostly. We was doing a two five, two six, two seven sometimes. But we put them out there, and Gail and uh, Kong during their segment, they did a three point four five. I've talked about this before. Sting and Angle did a two point seven, and they were making nowhere near the money that sting and angle were making. So I'm, I got to finish the story. So finally, Kong asked for more money. You know what they told her? <laughs> no. <laughs> <I bet. laughs> yeah, that's what they told her. And we, we can't afford it. And I read the letter. Kong said, read this. It wasn't a letter. It was like an email. And it made sense. Very, very uh, nice. And she just said, I think I deserve a pay raise. And Dixie, in her ultimate wisdom, and it was her money, I will say that. And she says, she, she denied it. She said, no. And not long after that, I think Kong, Kong turned her notice in and left. With the, because uh, uh, there's a couple of things, and there's another tweet I'm going to read out from Tony Khan as well that we uh, can react to. Now, very specifically, Tony Khan referred to 1 million views. Now, I'm fairly sure that you will have seen the meme out there that happens, or that's happened, you know, for a couple of years now, where if Dynamite, which always happens now, doesn't reach a million views, someone posts a sad-looking Shahid Khan, that's Tony's dad, with a big frown on, saying, no one million. Have you seen it? <laughs> I probably have. Yeah. So anyway, it's, it's a big thing. So apparently, according to only Dave Meltzer and Brian Alvarez, they have both come out to defend Tony Khan as having this brilliant idea of making this tweet for uh, because actually he was referring to the no one million meme, right? But mm -hmm. the problem is, is that it's... 
apart from the fact that it says one million viewers, it has nothing that relates to the original meme. Because the original meme is a photo that says no one million. So if Tony wanted to say something in reference to that, what he should have done was have a photo with John Cena and The Undertaker saying no one million. That would have been a direct reference to that meme. Whereas this is just... I don't even know what this is, apart from just like complaining sour grapes. Now, the only other thing that Brian Alvarez and Dave Meltzer have said... That hey, white you're gonna keep. You're gonna keep on. They're gonna block your ass. I'll get I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you right now. You, you know, I will get over it eventually. <laughs> uh, the, the only other thing uh, is, they said that oh, keep, to- dig- keep digging your own grave. That's Go fine. ahead. Tony. Uh, they also said that Tony Khan was great because after releasing the sour grapes, no one million Undertaker John Cena thing, that he also released a load of matches for the upcoming like Rampage and Collision shows which was mm-hmm. his way of apparently gaming the algorithm of Twitter to try and get more advertising for the shows. Which, in turn, when the ratings came out, they were the ratings were just in line with every other show, pretty much, that they've done that doesn't go head-to-head with WWE. Well, again, that's... I don't think most fans understand that. Most fans don't give a shit about that. You know, it's, it's just saying, oh, well, they outdrew so-and-so. They don't care, really. Just give them a good match with a good ending or a story, a continuing story, and they're happy. That's why they're watching the show. They're not watching the show for the, I don't know, the analytics. They're not watching the show for ratings. They're watching the show to be entertained. What if you were watching some, I don't know, Game of Thrones, and all of a sudden, oh, and then they start talking about what it drew and all this. Well, hey, if it's not drawing, guess what's going to happen? They're going to put something else in that spot. They're used to that. So while you got them there, entertain them. Do not, and I've said this forever, do not offend your fans. Keep them at all costs. Keep them tuned in. Oh, I know what I was going to talk to you about. Okay. Did you see the Tony Storm? The <laughs> it's like the twenty silent movie skits you did. We're gonna we're gonna talk about that. We're Good. gonna talk about that. Yeah. We're gonna talk about that. I promise you. Um, where was I? Okay, uh, there's one last Tony thing. He then wrote down shortly after the one million thing. This weekend marks one year since Mayo Clinic saved my mum's life. During her ordeal, many AW talent came to me alleging WWE tampering inducing them to break their contracts. I'll never forget these phone calls at her side in the hospital. It's when business became personal to me. This is nothing new. I mentioned it last year after she came home. It's relevant today because she checked in for surgery one year ago today. As I've mentioned several times since, Mayo Clinic are heroes, and thanks to them, her recovery from a very grim outlook has been a miracle. So Mm -hmm. what do you make? That's a lot to unpack there. What do you make of it all as far as contract tampering and sort of like lumping that in at the same time as her very his, mother. his very sick mother. Well, one thing, if she's very sick, he doesn't need to be at her bedside talking business. That's for one thing. He needs to be there for support and to help his mother get better. Mm-hmm. And he, or if he has to take the call, go out of the room, but leave somebody with the mother in case something goes wrong because he's there. He's there for support. And because she raised him from a little boy up to this big time wrestling promoter. As for all the WWE tampering, I think about 75% of that was manufactured because probably some of those contracts are coming up and they're calling him and telling him that WWE is interested in them, which is a lot different than contract tampering. If they call somebody or somebody say, say, James, you're, you're a wrestler and I call you and I start talking to you. If WWE wanted you, would you be interested? Now that's not, I'm not WWE. Mm -hmm. And you would say, well, according, it's according to the deal. I says, well, would you, and then we talk back and forth. Is that contract tampering? That's just asking. And then if I've talked to somebody in WWE, I said, you know, James might be interested in an offer, and they can follow through or not. 
But I think most of these offers was to keep their contract up in AEW. Of course, I would have to know who told Tony this. And I, I have the usual suspects. So, <laughs> but that, but that's what I think. And I think they bothered him, but now, now the burden of responsibility shifts to the talent because why are they bothering Tony at this? He's, he's in a very difficult period of his life. Why would they bother him like that? Hmm. That is interesting, See? isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, even if it was true, why would you bother him when his mother's sick and they know he's at the hospital? I'm sure he probably told them. Now, business is business. I understand that. But bothering someone at a hospital when their mother, she had cancer? Uh, what did she have? Uh, I don't Pretty. know. It may have been a stroke. Let me just look it up. What? Okay, I'm sorry, everybody. I couldn't find it. Uh, but, you know, if she's in the Mayo Clinic, she's going to be very, very sick, and, you know, the doctors helped her through it. Uh, now, I actually wanted to say this was because the most famous supposed contract tampering was uh, William Regal at this time, who caught Tony's ear while he was sort of tending to his mother's bedside. And then he sort of invoked family at the same time to get out of his AEW contract so he could go back to WWE. And I think the reason that he said was his son was in WWE and under developmental and he wanted to be with his son. And essentially, Tony let mm -hmm. him out of a valid AEW contract to uh, go back to WWE. Now, this isn't... Now, assuming this is some kind of emotional blackmail thing going on, this isn't on WWE. This would be on Regal, if it was. Emotional blackmail. I like that. Mm. I got to use that sometimes. Go on, you speak. I was taking a drink. Oh, okay. Well, it was nice of Tony to let him go. It was. But I think some of the guys, they... See, Tony doesn't know wrestlers. He doesn't know that this is a dog-eat-dog -dog business. And sometimes guys... They don't care what's going on. It's their problem takes importance over everything else, which I kind of understand because you can be in this business one day and gone the next. And I've heard of people working for, and I have an example of this, I've heard them working for 20 years to never do nothing. And a prime example of that is L.A. Knight. He worked for years and years and years and years and really made nothing much. He didn't even make a name to this last run in WWE. And now all of a sudden they see a little bit of a stone cold in him, which I admit that, and, and the fans have picked up on that. And is it anything they did? No, it's the way they presented him and, and he got over. So, but I think bothering Tony during that time with contract tampering rumors is a little is a little below the belt, I think, for the talent. The last thing he said was, not that I should be surprised, but the same WWE avatar accounts that spam me every day, no matter what I say or what it's about. Now turning their wrath to mom, recovering from a near-death experience, is why I straight hate these people to the bottom of my heart with all my soul. Yeah, he needs well, to put the phone down. He cannot, he needs, needs to block those people. Like Meltzer blocked you. Yes, he did. Yeah. And really, seriously, I was emotionally blackmailed. What? <laughs> I, was, I, I was emotionally blocked. <laughs> I forgot what he got mad about now. I, I, I know what it no, was. You told me. It was something to do with like a Memphis attendance. Or something, and he talked about... Like how many he sellouts was in a year or something? He was knocking Memphis and said Tennessee was the worst paying territory in the country. One of them was. That was the Nick Goulas one in, in Nashville. And when Jerry Jarrett pulled away, you know, he had more sense about the business, ran bigger buildings and had better attendance and had a much better show. 
And, you know, you take a $1,500 week back in 1980, that's like a $6,000 week now. Mm-hmm. Because we were back home every night. I mean, you just don't walk down the street and get a job making six grand a week. You just don't do that. But you drive up to Louisville 150 miles and, you know, you pick up $600 or whatever. And, and you do that three or four nights a week where well, you're okay. You can take a few duds during that week, but still make money. But that's what he was saying. What he was saying was, I'm such a loser that I work in a really crappy territory. But here's a guy that got into the business when never, <clears throat> ever having a match, never doing a finish, never understanding the business. And all of a sudden, he, he saw a need and he filled it. He was an opportunist. And I will say one thing about Melcher. He does have, you know, I mean, he's a, he's a word producing son of a gun. He is a pretty good writer, and he writes uh, in bulk. He he writes a lot, and some of his stuff is true, but some of it's most of it's not. So he has a fan base he has to appeal to. So, and he found out a long time ago if he gets negative, he will he will sell more copies. He just used to make his money off, I guess, just selling copies that he would mail out every week, which was a full-time job. So if he was making, uh, say, $2 a copy, and he's mailing out, I don't know, 1,000 copies, that's $2,000 a week, or maybe $2,000. That's that's double that. I don't know what he did. But he did it without taking bumps and without traveling. So, And he saw a a, uh, way to fit in, and he fit in. But then he became like uh, I don't know the the go to guy for everything. He was just because he wrote about it doesn't mean that he understood it. I don't even think he understands it now. Hamara, who's the other guy, Alvarez, mm-hmm. because he wrote about a Cody last year. Oh, this. Oh, no, they wrote about uh, Sami Zayn. What a great time to switch that title because they had that really, really hot crowd in Canada, and they were all over Sami Zayn. Well, of course, they're all over Sami Zayn. He's one of them. He's from there. He represents, I, what is it, Montreal? Mm-hmm. He represents whatever town they Quebec, were in in Canada. And they were all over him. Yeah, it's a feel-good feeling. But for creative, oh, now they just got to take it off of him. So putting it on somebody is a big, big deal now. So when anybody ever says, oh, they need to take it over, need to take it off, Roman Roman Reigns, they're going to take it off when they want to take it off. Or when Roman Reigns wants to, he wants to take a little extended vacation at home, that's when they're doing. Because they spent over three years getting Roman Reigns to this level, and somebody has to going to have to be pretty hot to get over that level. Mm-hmm. Everybody's assuming now it's going to be Cody Rhodes. Could it be Cody Rhodes, or could it not be Cody Rhodes? You know, a match I would like to see: Dave Meltzer go- versus um, <laughs> Brock Lesnar. I bet that'd be good. That'd be good. Uh, but he just put Brock Lesnar to sleep by making him read some of his damn Observer newsletters before the match. The bell ring, ding, 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 and Brock be asleep in the back, and he'd miss the match, and, and they'd count him out. Uh, right. Uh, we won't spend too much time with this because uh, I'll explain why in a second. Tammy Swi- uh, Switch. Tammy Sitch being recommended 26 years. Uh, calling the <laughs> WWE Hall of Famer a danger to society, a prosecutor is asking that Tammy Sonny Sitch be sentenced to the maximum penalty of 26 years in prison for driving drunk in a crash that killed a man last year in Ormond beach uh, this is what the prosecutor said by continuously driving under the influence without a vi- valid license the defendant has demonstrated a wanton disregard for the law and a clear refusal to abide by the law the state believes that the maximum sentence is the only way to protect the community from the defendant's repetitive and dangerous actions wrote assistant state attorney ashley to williger 
So 26 years. We've talked about this a couple of times before, and you've been saying 10 years plus. Is 26 years too much? Is that right? Well, this is what the see. This is a this is state law. It's a state case, right? Mm. Not a federal case. Mm. See, I, I know a little bit about the law. If it's federal case, and they say let's say they say 20 years, well. They don't go too much on that probation stuff. You'll serve about 17 of those 20. If they give her 20 years in state court, she could serve 10. And according to her behavior, mm-hmm. and they could let her out. But prisons are not to punish the guilty so much. Prisons are to protect the people that are still on the streets. See, when they take, when they let Tony, uh, Tammy. Tammy, run free. They take a chance of her getting drunk, going out there, getting in a car, and driving off and killing somebody. It's actually to protect us. So if they give her 26, I will be I will be surprised. But I think it's going to be 20 or above. Really? Because they, they, they got to go over her record. But this time she killed a guy. Here's a 75-year-old guy sitting in a car. Uh, the sun is shining. He's in Florida. Bam, he's dead. Just like that. Because she didn't care. And she doesn't care. When she gets, she has a severe drinking problem. And if they let her out, I think she would kill somebody else. Of course, I can't, I can't, I can predict that. I don't know if it's going to be true or not. But we know what her record is before and why would it change? So 26 years, that's the maximum penalty. But you think 20 now, because I think when we've talked about this before, you were predicting nearer 10. But is your uh, heart now going towards a higher number? How old is she now? 50, 52? Around that, yeah. I think she should go, to me personally, I think she needs to serve between 10 and 15 get her off the highway is what I think because if they keep showing oh we have lenience toward these drivers and this it doesn't have any teeth in it and now they have somebody with a name that people know so if they put it on her now that that will get out and everybody will know that do you think her celebrity status will help her or hinder it in the sense that maybe it could be an example made of her. Yeah. I think it'll work against her. Hmm. I think they're going to make an example out of her. And I don't know. I I have mixed feelings on this because Tammy's an idiot, a complete idiot. She can't help it. But she didn't mean to kill the guy, but she did. I mean, I don't. so that could be me or it could be you, it could be your friend, it could be somebody else, it could be a kid, it could be. So why wait for her to prove you wrong and when you could probably save somebody's life that has nothing to do with Tammy Sitch? Mm-hmm. So letting her out is like saying, okay, here, take this gun and just start shooting up in the air over that field over there. And if she hits somebody, who's, is that her fault because you told her to do it? Or is it her fault because she did it? So she's the one that did it. She's the one that needs to suffer. It says here that Sitch is set to appear November 27th for sentencing before Circuit Judge Karen Foxman at the S. James Foxman Justice Center in Daytona Beach. So we will be keeping an eye that's on six, that very much so. That, that, that's six weeks. Yeah. Correct? Yeah. About that? Yeah. Maybe even a tiny bit less, yeah. Uh, we will move you know, I'm on. Not, I'm not. I'm not that far from there. I might go over there. What pelter with rotten tomatoes or something? Or yeah, and I may be sitting in the car. She wouldn't. She wouldn't know it's me though. Well, I can wear a report. Mask. I, I yes, Texas I would. dirt has turned up. <laughs> a, a COVID mask. I'd wear that, and a and a wrestling mask on top of that. <laughs> or a wrestling match, and then a COVID mask. Yeah. My God, Texas, Jushin Thunder Texas. Liger has turned up to the courthouse. <laughs> Texas dirt, and I, I got a I got a big hat on too. So, 
Right, we will move on to the next thing, and this pertains to you. You know something, James? Yes. Listen. Yes. You need to be a little more serious when we do this podcast yeah, because fans not. listen to this. Fans listen to this to get information and to be entertained. But yet you're you're saying, I don't know. Go ahead. And you said you would turn up in a wrestling mask to the sentencing. But you laugh. See, you encourage me to do that. I, so you encouraged. You encourage my behavior. Are we saying we're bad for each other? Is that basically what you're saying? <laughs> okay, read your next subject. Next one p- pertains to you. Uh, Father James Mitchell recently gave an interview to Wrestling News. Uh, very brief. They went with Dutch Mantel, they being WWE, uh, to do the We the People thing. I wouldn't have fit. I couldn't do what Dutch did. That's kind of getting into a political thing and what not. So there was a rumour out there that James Mitchell was actually originally considered to manage Jack Swagger. Have you ever heard this before? Never heard it. And Jim wouldn't have been good at this anyway. Mm. Jim's a dark brooding figure. He was like a priest, a dark, you know, a priest who, who's on the dark side. He plays, and he has that that ox baker eyebrow that he turns up like that. And great talker, though, great talker. But as far as rallying people, I don't think <laughs> his interviews are not geared that way. His interviews are geared the other way. Could he have been considered? Yes, he probably could. They were looking for a voice for Jack. And they did try some different people, but they didn't have the same tone. Me being a veteran and me kind of doing that All-American thing before, not like the Jim Duggan All-American thing. But but Vince heard me the first day and says, hire him, pal. And that's what he did. Do you know any other name? Right. So I think originally, was it Bunkhouse Book? Who turned up like Bunk a week or two Bunk. before? Yeah, yeah, and he, he couldn't tried talk. him. He couldn't talk. Robert Fuller, he could talk, but again, the style, the style didn't fit. And James Mitchell, you know, I, I don't think he fit either. And even James agrees with me. Hmm. So to they, and I don't know who else they tried out. They didn't tell me. I don't care, but. I'd like if it was Jim Mitchell and then Jack Swagger is like a satanic altar boy kind of thing. Do you think that'd work? See, you're taking a gimmick, you're taking a th- idea, and you're already. This is the way creative works. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, you take the original idea, and all of a sudden, you just change the whole thing into a dark, brooding, you know, some kind of ideological <laughs> concept. <laughs> is that of what yours? Disco Inferno would do? Oh yeah, he'd do, he'd do that. Disco Inferno, I I, I, lo- I love him to death. He used to he he was on the creative in TNA for about two weeks. He walked in one day after we'd done been there two hours, three hours. I'm about ready to pull my hair out. Hair out. Jeff was checking the bullets in his gun. Vince was all messed up, mad or whatever, <laughs> and. Here comes Disco in, and he says, and he we laid it out for him. He says, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> I said, get the F out of here, yeah, damn it. And I, I was throwing shit. Then I came back in. He said, hey, I didn't, I didn't mean to piss you off. I said, I know. It's not you. It's the process. This process is killing me. I don't give a crap what it is, guys. Decide which way you want to go and let's go with it. Mm. Because so many things were flying off the walls. I think we were missing the whole point most of the time anyway. So we would have a center point and then we'd work all the way around it to get to the other side and then work our way back to where we were. Mm. It's like an hour of talk and nothing would be accomplished. Why wasn't Jim Mitchell ever picked up by WWE? Because I mean, I don't, uh, I don't know. Because you know, know, he had a great character, great talk, sure a, a, a niche character in the sense that you can't put him with just anyone. But uh, yeah, is it just Vince hates managers? Is that is that is that how you say that word? No. In here it is. You say niche, I think. Yeah, niche. Yeah. Mm. And how do you say it? Niche, niche. was well, French, isn't it? That's how you pronounce it. Yeah. 
So yeah, I, I think Vince got off managers for a while. And then when he kind of got back on them, maybe maybe he didn't like Jim's presentation. And but he actually he had to know what Jim was before because Vince kept up on this. He kept looking at these characters in different territories and because he was looking at them as a way for how could he take this character and make it work for him, make it work for WWE. So, and Buck asked Buck, uh, Buck, he wasn't a good talker. And they had brought him in before as, I think as Jack's father. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think they had brought him in and it didn't quite work. And, so when they brought me in, they told me the story. I said, well, I got to explain why I'm here. Why, why, what if I knew Jack when he was a kid and uh, he was, uh, and I was in, in Nam with his daddy and now I can help his son. So they said, yeah, that's good. So I actually tied my connection in with, uh, Jimmy and uh, and Jack and as family, I kind of tied it in there, and they just left it. Mm -hmm. So, see, that was partly my job. So, but I'm glad they picked me. I enjoyed my time there, and we could have done so much more. Mm, tell me but, about. It. But they pulled me out to manage Alberto Del Rio. That was a bomb waiting to drop. We uh, and, it, and it exploded halfway down, and it was a dud. <laughs> we, uh, I think we talked about that quite recently as well. It's on the YouTube <laughs> channel. Just search Alberto Del Rio. You'll find it, trust me. Next one, Ari Emanuel, who is the head honcho at the newly formed TKO on Vince McMahon. Once again, your favorite person, Dave Meltzer on Wrestling Observer Radio, said, well, he, McMahon, is out of creative. It's a big story because Ari Emanuel, what they were on the verge of closing the deal and had actually closed the deal in April, did media rounds saying Vince will be in charge of the company, WWE. And if me and Vince have a disagreement, it goes the way Vince wants because Vince is the guy. So then the deal went through, it only really went through about a month ago. And already Vince is out of creative because Ari Emanuel, so this is a real, this is, this is a, this isn't written out, this is him talking, so if it doesn't quite make sense when I'm reading it out. So this is a real interesting thing because it's the first time Vince is now in a position that his father was in 84 when his father had run the company for years and years and years, and then he was just an employee of Vincent Kennedy McMahon. Now, Vincent Kennedy McMahon was the guy making all the decisions, and now Vince has, in fact, been overruled. Even though when he merged the company, he was told that this would not happen. It did happen, and it's a really interesting thing. And that statement when Ari Emanuel was talking about the reasons the stock is down and he mentioned Vince's name so it's very interesting I think what is going to happen Vince's power is clearly marginalized there's no way around that so that is low key we're going to be talking about low key in a bit I think uh, but low key <laughs> massive news that Vince McMahon has already been marginalized shoved to the sidelines of the company he retired from last year and then took over the power reins at the beginning of this year what is the, is the, uh, have, what is the stock worth now Ooh, I can up or look down, it up. up or down, up or down. Oh, way down, uh, way down. I think it's probably in the 80s when it was in the 100s. I'll get you a specific number in a second, but you carry on. Okay, if it's in the 80s, that's uh, quite a drop from 100. Mm -hmm. So, but you look at their houses, they're full. Their pay-per-views are selling well. They still got the Saudi Arabia deal. Their merchandise is doing well. And I think... They're getting ready to move from Fox to another network, and USA. I'm pretty, I'm I'm pretty sure uh, that stock is going to be coming up. So if you're going to want to buy stock in WWE, I think now is the time to buy it. Let me tell you what it is. Uh, it went from a high of 105.50 on 19th of September, and it's currently at a low. Of seventy six ninety four as of Thursday nineteenth of October twenty six percent drop. And what did they attribute that to? Well, partly Ari has mentioned Vince McMahon, 
Uh, this is why he brought up his name. Uh, I don't know. Uncertainty in the market, but also the other thing, I've not written this down, was that uh, the Saudi Arabians have bought one of UFC's competitors. I say competitors. They're, they're like impact to, to WWE. Uh, another Bellator. MMA outfit called, uh, no, not even Bellator, PFL, I think. So mm -hmm. uh, the theory was that partly the stock market had, and um, Wall Street had overestimated the importance of PFL uh, to UFC, and uh, also mentioning Vince McMahon as part of creative. And also, didn't mention this, but Vince McMahon is currently, I think, still under investigation by the federal government as well. Yeah, but I, I'm trying to, I, I'm not a big guy on stocks, so I don't know swings and ups and downs and but people that study this will probably have a reason for it i don't see there's any reason to me but i don't know what i'm talking about when it comes to stocks i don't know why it would drop 26 percent ah uh, you've just reminded me one more thing the smackdown uh rights fees were less than they were hoping for in um, I think they announced I don't know pluck a name out the uh, number out there something they'd hope for like 1.7 billion over five years they ended up getting 1.4 billion and they'd overestimated what they were hoping for and that's also what has uh, taken a tumble on the stock. Well, that could have been a, a major cause, a major cause because mm -hmm. it drops 1.7, 1.4. That's that's about 20 percent. Mm -hmm what it is mm -hmm. so what well, we'll see but i still think wwe stock is a is a winner i do yep i i think you're probably right there it's probably a good time to buy now next one you watch this as did i cringe worthy well one of a couple of cringe worthy things the weird edge versus ricky starks promo should we talk about it <laughs> or should we move on or do you have you got things to say well it was a uh It's not too long, so it, it it was a memorable interview. It looked like uh, Edge got a little pissed off. What was the, what was the, Ricky Starks? He said something he shouldn't have said. It's called him like bug eyed, didn't he, or something? No, he said something bug eyed to Edge, I think. Mm -hmm. Is that what he said? Mm -hmm. Well, let's watch it. It's AEW. You never know when Don Stevens is going to be hanging around waiting to copyright strike you. Oh, she may strike it? Yeah, probably. We could blur it out, I suppose, and just listen to okay. it. Okay, explain explain this to the fans that are listening in. Oh. They uh, do they do this in-ring in interview. It's sort of tough to say because it seems like it goes off script really, really early on, and then they just start stuttering around and then trading barbs and then Edge calls Ricky Starks a vanilla midget. Which is funny because uh, uh, Brian Danielson's 5 foot 8 stood next to him as well. Yeah. So I mean I think Edge is like 6'4 or something like that. But and then it just sort of just just stops and that's it. It's just weird. They, they just do the interview and insult each other. The crowd pops a few times and then they just get out. Pretty much, yeah. They had no contact or nothing? I think that's basically it, yeah. I think the clip I showed you was, what, like 30-odd seconds? Not long. No. All right, so... Yeah. Yeah. But it, but when I saw it, I thought to myself, well, did this lead to something? This, are they just talking and trading barbs and all of a sudden they leave? That's nothing. They left it open. Mm-hmm but not really interestingly open. They just left it open, period. <laughs> okay, next order of business, and I know you watched this. Nick Aldis has made his debut on SmackDown last Friday. He is now the uh, SmackDown GM, sort of taking over from Adam Pierce. Uh, Piss. <laughs> Adam Pierce. Uh, mm -hmm. Being shifted over to WWE Raw exclusively, so now Nick Aldis is going to be the... Uh, SmackDown authority figure. Uh, talk about when he debuted. It seemed like quite an anticlimactic sort of bringing on of a new character, but he sort of wins the crowd over quickly. Well, I think the crowd, that they know who he is. Nick Aldis is a great talker. I think a great, it's a good addition 
to to SmackDown because, and I think he's such a change from Adam Pierce. Is that his name, Adam Pierce? Yeah, well, it's not Adam Piss, like I said. Yeah, I completely misspoke. Adam Pierce. Yeah, you did. So you should have you apologized yet? Uh, I'll do it next week. Okay, but they can do a lot of bullshit with you know Aldis because he's used to that stuff anyway. I mean, and he does have a humorous side too. Plus, he's British, which I think he fits in perfect with that SmackDown bunch. And I do believe they will be doing something between Pierce and Aldis. You know, when he said, I'm look, I look forward to our conversations in the coming future. A healthy competition. Yep. And I think we're going to see them at each other's throats. And, but I, I miss actually, uh, Aldis in the ring. He was great, great in the ring, great in ring talker. Of course, it could lead to that. I don't know what it, because now they have uh, a general manager that can actually get in the ring mm-hmm. and have a match. I mean, that's not going to be right off the bat, but they have that hand to play. So now Nick Aldis is not just like a one dimensional character. He can actually get in the ring, have a match against say a baby face that he's been given a tough time to, or however they tell the story. But I, I, I do like his addition to SmackDown. I really do. And the, the clip you're talking about on SmackDown when he gets in the ring was it was not anticlimactic, but they introduced him like kind of offhand. But he was in, but the the story was told. Nick Aldis is the general manager of SmackDown, and now he has somebody to play off of. He has Adam Pierce, and let's see where they do what they do with it. Yeah, they established him as a babyface straight away when he shook Dominic well, he Mysterio's hand and he yeah, went, I'm a big fan to, of your dad. Uh, that was good. Uh, that, that was a good, good. line. So, yeah, he, he got the crowd on uh, immediately. What makes a good and, authority? And it's, oh. No, well, and it also, Dominic, the crowd, they have trained that crowd well. When he talks, nobody wants to hear him, which is, that's great for him. Mm. That's great for Dominic because... He's saying, shut up. I think he should tell him to shut up. Uh, he, I think he should sue the whole crowd. <laughs> he should get all their names <laughs> and expect for in the mail a lawsuit coming from him for trying to railroad his, his job, trying to force him out of a job. Of course, that's not going to happen, but... I used to threaten when I would do in-ring interviews, I would threaten to sue the whole crowd. <laughs> and I says, and just leave your name at the door when you leave, because you'll be getting a letter from me and from my lawyer uh, for your rude and uncivil behavior toward me tonight. And then I tell them if they didn't shut up, I would leave the ring. Oh my, that's what you, it's like saying, it's like a little kid. Don't do this, but it's reverse psychology, which is saying, do this. So what Dominic is saying is don't boo me, but boo me. And they do it every time. What makes I'm looking good, for, I'm looking forward to this. What makes a good authority figure in 2023? Because no one's ever going to beat Vince. Eric Bischoff was no. great in his day. There's been some great ones. There's been some terrible ones. So what makes a good authority figure? Vince was great. But they took a little time to establish Vince, but once he got there, but I think Aldis might not reach that level. That's almost the pinnacle of the manager level. He's the boss. I think at times they need to bring Vince in <laughs> or or have Aldis go to go to Vince just to say, What do you think about this? And we well, get out of here, get that. Like he's seeking advice from Vince on how to proceed. Then there he's getting some of the heat that Vince used to have. And Vince had nuclear heat. 
I mean, all he had to do was walk out there and he had heat. I mean, you can't buy heat like that, but he had it naturally and he is just a heel anyway. Well, some of the stuff he did, like the kiss my ass club. Oh, that was making the best one I ever saw was the Jim Ross kiss my ass club. Mm -hmm. Oh my God. I watched it and I literally rolled watching it. Cause what I was thinking of when they told you and they did Jim Ross, that was a rib on Jim had to be. Cause he said, let's get Jim to kiss his ass. Oh, he'll go nuts. Well, they didn't give a crap. They wrote it. Vince liked it. Vince said, Hey pal. Yeah, I like it. I like it. So what is JR going to do? JR has to do it. Oh, he didn't want to do it, <laughs> but uh, it was, it, it was really, I mean, that's something that writes itself. And uh, where else are you going to see anybody kiss somebody's butt, <laughs> but a wrestling show, you don't see that anywhere else. <clears throat> you don't even see that in movies when it's, you never see it. So if you ever want to see it, you'd have to watch Raw or I don't know if even SmackDown was even around in those days. But it was it was one of the ways that 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 Vince had that nuclear heat. Now if he could just get fifteen percent of that to Nick Aldis, twenty would be great. I mean, Nick would be on his way. I mean, let's see how they tell this story. That's the beauty of watching wrestling. You don't know exactly how the stories you want to go, but you see the potential where it can go. So we'll see. I've got an idea. You oh, have an idea? Yeah. So I want to you, you know how I want to, I, Nick, I want to hear Nick Aldis goes to get advice from Vince McMahon. But because oh, you like that, you, you like that part. Yeah, but because Vince McMahon can't apparently, maybe he can't be at the shows anymore because Ari Emanuel doesn't want him to be, or something like that. Well, but, he's still on the bed. Yeah. Have you have you have you seen Star Wars? Oh yeah. So it could be the bit where Darth Vader, you know, kneels down in the middle of a giant room, and then a massive hologram of Vince McMahon as the Emperor with the hood over his face and everything starts disseminating advice on how to take over WWE. Or something like that, where it basically just gives the most evil advice in the entire world for Nick Aldis to follow. You would have to invest invest in a hologram machine, though. Well, <laughs> you hate it, don't you? you no, I don't hate idea. it. I, I love. I, I, this is how creative works. I love the thought of it. <clears throat> I like him just actually going to events. And he gets the, the first part of it out, and the camera has to go. So now we know that this audience is being coached by Vince. And who knows what? To me, that would intrigue me. What evil is coming out of Vince's head and going into Nick Aldis? And here's something weekly. Nick because he came out in a nice, I think he came out in a blue suit on SmackDown. Yeah, Over he did. the months, his suits start getting progressively darker and darker throughout the week, so you know he's getting more evil, and you know he's getting more affected and, by uh, bad here, intentions. Here's one. He grows a little mustache. Well, like Hitler. Like Vince. Oh, like Vince. <laughs> he grows the little mustache, and he comes out. And I think they could do a lot with that. That's just the thought. So I want everybody to think about that because that's what you got to, you got to take it from where it is right now and move it just a little bit at a time. And still he could be in the middle doing all this time, but he's getting advice from uh, Vince and the whole thing behind Vince is Vince is looking for a way to get back in and take power. Hmm. See, it's for Vince, too. Vince is not just being befriending him for the hell of it. He actually called Nick Aldis to come and see him. They have, they'd have to tell that story. But it would make sense, right? Yeah, it would make sense. So I was just making a yeah. note. Uh, right, I shall 
move on. Should we talk about the Ted DiBiase Jr. indictment thing? Or we've more oh, or less, yeah, that, that. I was going to say, we've more or less covered it, haven't we, in previous episodes? Or have we, we have more? covered it, but when's the trial? Oh, it doesn't. <coughs> I'm sorry to say, it doesn't say <coughs> when the trial is. I think he's going to jail. Let me read you this then. All right, read me that. So this guilty, is from guilty, guilty. Oh. I've seen you yeah. on the JBL and Cole show with yeah. a judge's wig and a gavel, right. and I think you really need to start breaking that out. Once Tammy is sentenced, once Ted DiBiase Jr. is sentenced, others. This could be did a running thing ever, for the podcast. Did you ever watch that stupid little running show? They yeah, had? I did, <laughs> and it was so stupid, but it was. Actually, fun to watch, you know. We'd say neutral, neutral, <laughs> a neutral witness. So we called up uh, Cesaro. <laughs> <laughs> he was from Switzerland. <laughs> he was neutral. <laughs> and then what was what was Cody Rhodes? He was a uh, what was the whole suit about? You remember? I can't remember. No, I re- the last one I watched was not too long ago because I was searching for something else. And you were just hiding behind a bus the entire time, trying to do something sneaky. And I can't remember what that was. It was me and JBL. Mm. I think I, I don't remember that. They just told me what to do. Hey, how how I, many of those did you film? It was like it seemed like dozens. It seemed oh, like a new one every day. Yeah, it was. They they filmed a bunch. I just came in there because JB, JBL says you need to make Dutch the judge or bring him in on this or something. I never really understood it. And they were only like five minutes long. I would like to get that whole series together. What was the name of it? The JBL and Cole Show. <laughs> That's a stupid name of, of its own. Mm. But I need to get JBL on here and have him explain it. See, we've been threatening that for ages, and you've never, you've never. I can't done get it. a hold of him. He's hiding from the. He's hiding from somebody. He's hiding from justice. I think he's hiding from the IRS. <laughs> the and if IRS. he came on here, the, yeah, the real one. N- yeah, not yeah, IRS, not Mike Rotunda. Yeah, I think uh, I am going to call him today. Good, you should do. Uh, is Michael Cole like really hilarious or something that we didn't know, and he was like participating a lot in these JBL and Cole shows? No, he's not funny at all. <laughs> at all. I mean. Watching water boil is more entertaining, really. Uh, JBL is entertaining as hell. Cole, I don't know. We should do a review of one of those one day. Uh, maybe, okay. with, maybe with Bradshaw. In fact, okay, right. Ted DiBiase Jr. indicted. So this was from, I believe, like justice.com or just, justice.org or something. Mm-hmm. So very official sounding. A federal indictment was unsealed today in Mississippi, charging a former professional wrestler with misappropriating millions of dollars in federal safety net funds and intended for needy families and low income individuals in Mississippi. Now, we know all this. We've been through this a load of times. Uh, I'm going to try and skip ahead slightly here. So anyway, so uh, misappropriating uh, from two different organizations. Uh, I'm going to give you some names here. Uh, Davis, uh, I don't know who Davis is, was the executive director of Mississippi Department of Human uh, Services as part of the alleged scheme after federal funds were issued to MDHS. Davis directed MDHS to subgrant the funds to two nonprofit organizations, Family Resource Center of North Mississippi and Mississippi Community Education Center, which were operated by Webb and New, respectively, to other people involved. Davis then alleged that... Uh, allegedly directed Webb and New to award sham contracts to various individuals and entities purportedly for the delivery of social services, including at least five sham contracts that were awarded to Ted DiBiase Jr.'s companies, Priceless Ventures, LLC, and Familia Orientum, LLC. And it's further alleged in the indictment under these sham contracts, FRC and MCEC provided millions of dollars in federal funds to MDHS, to DBSE and his companies for social services that DBSE did not provide and did not intend to provide. DBSE allegedly used these federal funds to buy a vehicle and a boat and for the down payment on the purchase of a house, among other expenditures. Uh, very uh, right at the end, it says a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison for each wire fraud count and maximum penalty of 10 years in prison for each count of theft concerning programs, receiving federal funds for each count of money laundering. So he could really go 
away for the rest yeah. of his life here. Good. I don't think he will. But so what he did, folks, is he, he got this position where he could allocate funds to go to different organizations that he controlled. They were sham organizations, right? Mm. No, I and think he, what, what, well, his businesses were, I mean, they were legally uh, uh, businesses, but they were offered sham contracts to these comp- these shell companies that Ted DiBiase Jr. had, where instead of giving the money away to where they should have gone, he just kept the money for himself. And some of these other people named in this indictment, they all shared well, in the profits. If they've gone this far with it, I think they know about it. And I think he may be going away. Now, Ted, Ted DiBiase was named this, one of these suits. Mm -hmm. Has his kind of faded in the background? He's not been brought up at the moment. His other son, Brett, I think, pled guilty. And then Ted DiBiase. I I I thought he turned state's evidence. Did he? I don't know. Oh, so he was a rat. Well... Well, I wouldn't go himself. as far as calling him a rat, but when you ran out your family, <laughs> I mean that that's pretty that's that's pretty low. You know what I mean? Yeah. Do you think Daddy's so, going to be indicted? In this? And it's and it's from the state of Mississippi too, which they don't have a lot of money. Poorest, so poorest state in the union. I it is a poorest state, and it always has been. I don't know why, but I, I've never seen anybody. Oh, I want to go live in Mississippi. <laughs> I don't, you don't hear that a lot. It's, it's like, I want to go to Florida. I want to go to Virginia or Texas or never heard anybody say, I'm dying to go live in Mississippi. Never heard that. Now, next one. We, I think we've got three more bits of news. And then we might even get a couple of questions about WCW. We'll see how we go. Brett Hart's hilarious. I, I thought it was hilarious. I mean, just. Like the bitterness or the jokey bitterness or whatever you want to call it, it's brilliant. Brett recently signed a photo for a fan. It's a photo of himself, and he inscribed it. Uh, we've already sworn on this episode, haven't we? We can do the swear words, or shall I bleep myself? No, we can do it a little bit, not not to the extreme. Okay. According well, to what you're going to say, I thought you run the don't you run the disclaimer before the show? God no, 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 not unless Kenny Bowling's on. Or Jamie Dundee. Well, well, I love I love the disclaimer. You've been warned. Okay, go ahead. So Brett signed a photo of himself to a fan. Fuck Bill Goldberg, shittiest wrestler who ever stepped in a ring. Brett Hitman Hart. And the photo yep. is him with a big old smile as well. It's brilliant. I haven't seen it. I sent it to you. I couldn't find it. It was just a deal. Okay. But anyway, I, I know what you you go show it. I'll show it. One sec. Okay. I see. I, have, I see it now. I have sent it to you. Here's your reaction. Are you sure I'm on screen too here? Yeah, yeah, you're on screen. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'll put the photo up. Okay. F dot 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 K exclamation point. Bill Goldberg with a big smile. Shittiest wrestler who ever stepped. In a ring, love you. <laughs> it does say love you, but Bret Hart, more of the big smile. You know, I got to kind of agree with Brett because Goldberg was pushed into that position as unbeatable because he will win his matches in two minutes or, or whatever. But then when it come time for him to kind of sail, he didn't know how to do it. So he was on, I mean, Goldberg didn't get himself over. They got Goldberg over, but Goldberg didn't really know how. So when it, when it went time for him to, to maybe go 10 minutes, 15 minutes, he would, he would die. The match would die because they, they made him almost too strong his selling wasn't worth a crap, and he was lost, and his opponents were lost. Therefore, the match was lost. So, so you can create these these characters to be too strong, 
And I don't know who you'd have to beat him down because he was just, he was almost the unbeatable, untouchable guy. Long as they kept him in that role and, and him to win, he was fine and it'd have to be short. But if he had to put some time in, he was lost. Depended on the person. So, uh, Diamond Dallas Page definitely got a really good match out of him that went, you know, way beyond 10, I think. Um, so, but the deal is you have to get him in the back. It's almost a day or two coaching job to get him there. You could probably get it out of him, but you'd have to convince him it wasn't going to hurt him, and you'd have to do a, a lot of damn selling, really. You have to sell what you wanted to do to him and get him to buy it. But very few guys could do that. Diamond Dallas Page was on that level. He could get him to do it. And maybe a few, Scott Hall was on that level, maybe to get him to do it. But other than that, he had very few opponents. Did he ever, and did he ever match up with Undertaker anywhere? Yes, he did. It was only a few years ago. It was in Saudi Arabia. And that was the one where Goldberg, now, I can't remember the story. Did he, like, headbutt and nearly knock himself out before he even walked to the ring? And then he tried to do the... <laughs> so he's trying to, like, hey, G, he's trying what? to G himself up, and then he's smashing his head on the locker room, and he goes, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds something like a wrestler would do. Yeah. Knock themselves out before they go out there. So I, I never knew they wrestled. Oh, it was a disaster. Complete disaster, because Goldberg nearly killed Undertaker by dropping him on his head for the uh, jackhammer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was... We should review that one day, because that was, that was a complete We should. Disaster. Okay, Goldberg got into a fight with who? Jericho? Yes, he did. About... What was that about? Didn't he do something to Lex? I mean, uh, to uh, Luger? Uh, I'll get it right in a minute. I'm, in, I'm interested dropped, now where this is going. I think I think he dropped a knee on somebody and cut their eye. Hmm. Randy Orton, I think. I don't remember this. Well, I guess I'm just a liar. No. So what? What's the story then? Something happened, and and I'll get it right here. No, no, no. Bit. I know what you mean. And he came, it's not and Goldberg. He came, and he came back. Who was that? It was Brock Lesnar and Randy Orton. It was, yeah. But Jericho got in a fight with him. Yeah, Jericho, I think, confronted Brock Lesnar over it, yeah. But uh, we, I think we're going beyond the... Uh, but didn't they actually get into a fight and throw some punches or something? It's probably just, it's probably split up before it ever happened. I don't know. But, you know, as far as Jericho goes, I mean, he did, even, he did confront Goldberg as well when Goldberg first got into the WWE in 2003, I think, because they had some mm -hmm. lingering issues from WCW because Goldberg essentially refused to work with Jericho. Why? Well, because in Goldberg's mind, Jericho was beneath him and Jericho was making fun of him on interviews for several weeks. On beforehand. the interview. Yeah, yeah, on interviews. You know what? He was actually trying to build interest in their eventual match. And then Goldberg went to Eric Bischoff and said, nope, that's not happening. No way. And then he just got it cancelled. So he didn't like he, the way he was being portrayed by Jericho. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's great. It is, that's one of the weird I things. mean, he sold it so well <laughs> that the guy he was talking about it, uh, about it, uh, him on TV, he bought it. So yeah. that was well, good. The thing is, he's basically got one year in the business at that point, Goldberg. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't, he doesn't know what's good and what's bad for his character but the thing yep. is i think i think bill would say this himself was he was being surrounded by master manipulators in hall and nash and hogan and trying to i mean as soon as as soon as goldberg won that heavyweight title it was all over for him in the sense that as soon as he was the champion all of a sudden he was booked worse than when he was before he was champion in the sense that i mean there's even some pay-per-views he wasn't even on so I think mm -hmm. it's crazy. If you look at that like five-month spell between him having the title and then losing the title to Kevin Nash, which is his own ridiculous story, 
is that I think on like one pay-per-view as champion, he was in a battle royal to determine a number one contender, even though he was the champion, and Goldberg won. So, huh. wait a minute. So he established no one <laughs> as a contender. Uh, I've never heard that. When was that? Uh, Ninety-eight. Okay, he, he was in a battle. He was a champion. I believe that's yeah. I believe that's right. Yeah, he was champion. Nobody, wait a minute, nobody figured that out, that he was a champion, and they were trying to determine a number one challenger. Are you sure that he didn't sit back and watch the match? No, I'm pretty sure he was in it. I'm pretty sure okay. he was in it. I hope we're, I'm not speaking out of school here. I'm sure he was we're, in it, we're and gonna, he won. Okay, we're going to crowdsource this. If anybody <clears throat> remembers this happening, let us know, because I've never heard that. But I would like to check on the on whether that's true or not. Do you want me to, give me a minute. Okay, we're back recording, and I was absolutely right. Goldberg won an NWO Invitational Battle Royal uh, by last eliminating the giant Paul White, the Big Show. So he was in the semi-main event, and the main event was Diamond Dallas Page and Jay Leno, as in that Jay Leno versus. Hollywood yeah. Hogan and Eric Bischoff. So Goldberg yeah. is the champion, standing around with his dick in his hand, with no time, with no challengers, and he's still on the semi-main event under Jay Leno. And the battle royal was to establish a number one contender. Well, I don't know if it was officially to establish a number one contender, but <clears throat> I mean, if someone eliminates Goldberg from a battle royal, then they must surely be in title contention. Okay, are you sure it wasn't a title match? Uh, I'm looking at it. It was definitely not a title match, no. Which doesn't make sense either, but... Yeah. So it was a non-title, non-number one contenders, NWO Invitational Battle Royal, which Goldberg won. Well, we're going to have to revisit that and talk about what are some of the really thoughts <laughs> that went behind this booking. Oh, my God. Oh, it makes you upset, doesn't it? Okay, right, we've got a couple of bits of... Uh, two more bits of news. Christian Cage and Brian Alvarez. We are going to watch this one because... Please. It's, you watched it already, I, I loved. I love... Folks, I've watched this before. Watch it. This was after, what, the last... The, their last... AEW's last pay-per-view, Wrestle Dream. So we're a bit... They had a scrum. This. They had a scrum. Mm. Brian Alvarez asked Christian Cage a question... You got to see it to believe it. Here we go. Okay, you ready? The ready. The floating head of Christian Cage is asked a question by Brian Alvarez. When did you... Uh, Great, like talking to Marks. When did you first <laughs> see Nick Wayne wrestle? And what were your thoughts when you saw that first match? I've never seen Nick Wayne wrestle. Never. Now, I need to pause <laughs> here and point out that Christian Cage had done commentary on a Nick Wayne match like a couple of weeks earlier. Mm-hmm. Do you wrestle? <laughs> Thank you. Do you wrestle? No. You don't wrestle. I did back in the day. But... I'm sure you sucked, which is why you're here <laughs> asking me questions. I wrestled his father. <laughs> what? what you can, did you give a star rating tonight? Did you give me I a really cool a star, star rating? rating? I did not give a star rating. So what's the question again? I was wondering what you what you thought when you first saw Nick Wayne wrestle. But you said you never saw him. I've wrestle. never seen I've never seen him wrestle. There you go. How can Christian make that the most awkward interaction in the world? It was an awkward. And who was asking the question? Brian Alvarez? Yeah, your favorite. I don't think I've ever met the guy, to tell you the truth. But he called him a mark. Have you ever wrestled? Have you ever seen, what was the question again? <laughs> Have you ever seen a grown man naked? Yeah. Are you a fan of gladiator movies? Yeah. <laughs> but he really, he really ripped into Brian Alvarez. And you can tell that uh, Christian didn't want to be here at all. Because the scrums... Wrestlers aren't used to scrums after the match. And especially 
Why would what? Well, I wouldn't mind if they didn't just immediately break kayfabe after the pay per view that they just wrestled on. Like, I don't I mean, understand that. Yeah, just stay in character. Why? Like, why just give it? Um, yeah, we all know what it is, but why just ruin the illusion within minutes of the big show that you paid for? Mm -hmm. I don't get it. Does WWE have these? Mm, to a point. Didn't they have not one like not too long ago with Triple H? Yeah, but I think they're very sh like far shorter affairs, and it's mostly Triple H talking about whatever information he wants to give out, you know, of like money brought in to the city that day or tickets sold, that kind of thing. But Tony Khan and AEW, they have it for a lot of guys. See, some of these guys shouldn't be out asking or being asked questions about a match that just happened. Christian is one thing because he's been there. These other green guys, they can get buried out there quickly. And when they get buried, guess where it, all those, that footage is going to go everywhere, everywhere. So to me, if you have a scrum, I think AEW or WWE needs to remain, have control over it and let out what they want to let out. Of course, that would, that that put up they'd put up a big scream about that, and I don't blame them because you have a scrum to ask questions and uh, you get an answer and all of a sudden up nope, can't use it can't use it I I would too so why even have it I mean we went years and years and years and years without a news conference after a pay per view I've done one mm. and but it was not. Not not the newspaper guys or the dirt sheet guys. It was like two WWE guys. So they could pick and choose. And I still have a picture of me and Swagger at one. We're sitting at this desk and it's like after the game. And if I find it, I'll, I'll send it to you. Mm. But But this scrum after the match to me is new. Even the term scrum. I know that is a that's a soccer term, right? <clears throat> rugby. Oh, they have scrums. Scrum is a, a rugby it when is. they like huddle huddle up. Yeah, the scrum. That's what they, <laughs> they. So they call this a scrum. Mm -hmm. Same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, but rugby is when they all get together and they throw the ball and they kick it out or wherever it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, is so, Christian the greatest shit disturber in wrestling today? Well, in that in that particular case, he was because. But see, those guys love that because he's talking to them. He makes them somewhat a star by getting kind of embarrassed and humiliated. See, the people they don't see it that way, but between Alvarez and uh, Christian, they do. So you could tell there's a little animosity between those two. And you could tell Christian didn't want to be out there, but he went out there. Christian is probably one of the best they got right now because he, he never comes out of character and he understands what he's trying to do. So I wish that maybe uh, Edge had been received a little bit better or they handled Edge's return a little bit better. But still, the angle between Christian and Edge is still intact. Mm -hmm. The last bit of news. The retirement of Sting. Came out on Dynamite yesterday as we record this. So it'll be two days yep. ago as this comes out. Sting talks about the guys he travelled up and down the road with the influence. Oh, in fact, actually, before he does that, Tony Schiavone. So, and I always love it when Tony Schiavone does it. This is Sting! And then Sting comes out and it's great. Uh, Sting talks about the guys he travelled up and down the road with the influences in his professional career and everyone boos Hulk Hogan but everyone cheers Ric Flair and everyone cheers Dusty Rhodes of course and why Sting and other older wrestlers keep coming back to wrestling. They'll retire I mean Terry Funk's the most famous for it and then they just can't help themselves they, they come back for a variety of different reasons but mostly for <clears throat> if not financial the more of the crowd and everything. Uh, in his original retirement, which he says is 2015, but you're gonna, I know you're gonna dispute that original retirement. Says he didn't sit well with him. And that the one thing that is for sure about Sting is that nothing's for sure. 
<coughs> Sting announces in the great state of Texas that his last match will be at AW Revolution 2024, so no date has been given for that pay-per-view, but the 2023 Revolution was in late March, so we're looking like it's going to be late March of 2024. Sting says the one thing sure about Sting is that he is absolutely retiring at Revolution 2024, when he will be either 64 or 65. Uh, his birthday's March 20th. So, you saw it. I thought it was. I thought it was. Well, forget what I thought. What do you think? Oh, it was okay. People liked it. I mean, they like they like to see Sting. He said in there that he is not made for some kind of matches. I tell you what, he's not made for is diving off ladders onto tables. <laughs> that almost killed him. And I'm uh, and it was his idea. It had to be his idea to do that. But, and I think the people felt a little sorry for him. Really? He's trying to do stuff that he really wouldn't have done back in his, back in his prime. Probably somebody said, Hey, why don't you jump off this ladder, dive off this ladder onto this table and we'll break the table. He just said, are you nuts? I'm not doing this, but he gets to 64 years old. Oh, I, I'm going to, I'm going to prove I'm going to prove I can still do it. But he almost, he almost killed himself. He really did. So, and I remember that he had retired before, I think in 2003. Essentially, when, uh, when, three, when, I think. when WCW essentially, well, closed, it definitely closed. And then he was doing a couple of shots here and there for like the Australian WWA company or whatever. But he was essentially retired. And then Dixie Carter and the old checkbooks out. Yeah. And then she wrote it. She wrote him that big check. And all of a sudden his retirement plans were put on hold and he went out there. But see, the deal is when you get a guy that's retired, kind of like that, it's hard to do anything with him because. And back in, he would have been like the mid forties then are coming up on 50 very hard to do well, it's not hard to do but you got to watch what you do with this with, with, with a guy like sting because you got to protect his image you got to protect his legacy and his health you got to protect all that and keep him keep him competitive and keep him strong so that's quite a bit to put on a, a creative team. But you can't build the company around him either. No, you can't. See, when you talk, that's, that's one guy. You can not You can build a company around one guy, but you got to be slowly filling in the blocks. Who's he going to face? Who's he going to wrestle? You're going to build your heels, and you can run them through Sting. You can do that for a while. It'll work for a while. But then you better have a plan or some more people coming along that when this angle, when this angle dies down, you got one right here. And when this angle goes down, this one moves in its place. Then this one goes here, the or the competitors go here. And it's continually revolving like that. Otherwise, you get stuck with downtime, down periods, or just periods that just don't succeed at all. See, the WWE in the last six months or the year, they've done a tremendous job. Now they have a bunch of people over with the crowds. So I think when they put on a show now, it's almost like an all-star show because a lot of those guys, they've done something with them on TV. They've made them interesting. So when they have a match, doesn't matter who wins, people see a good match. And with competitive people and people they know, it's not like putting Joe Smo out there against Leonard Brand or whatever. They know these people, even the underneath guys. And I say underneath, I don't mean underneath in a demeaning manner. I mean, underneath guys are like your first, second, and the third match. They're, they're filling out your card. But even they're starting to mean something. So when you can get your card looking like that, you got a great card. You do. But 
and you can't, and they've been trying to run on Roman reigns, but they had no baby faces because they used them up. Now they have those for, for Roman. You, you know, he's, he's got Cody coming up, got Gunther coming up. I mean, he has opponents that could step in there and, and handle this. Uh, my, my thought is who is the, who is the next big heel? Unless it's got to be Gunther. Don't you think? Mm -hmm. Could well be. Because I think he they have put him over in such a way, not a lot of screw jobs, if any, really. And putting him, he needs to be put with guys who can take his take his brutality. And if you know, if they get beat, they get beat. I don't think it hurts anybody to put in a hell of an effort against Roman Reigns in a match and then get pinned because eventually it's going to work. So somebody, if you had a real fight on the street, somebody would win if it's a fight to the finish. I've never seen a DQ on the street unless the police come in. So I think they, they're in a good spot. That becomes a no but, contest. Well, yeah, but that's like both guys, they're pulled apart or something like that. that that'll take <clears> you so far too. But, uh, with um, with Sting and the retirements. Now, I said in the preamble before that he said that the first time he retired was in 2015, but that's not really true because no. the old the old joke was, and you've said this before, is that Sting would retire every single time his contract was about to come up in TNA. Oh yeah, and then wait for somebody else to write a check. It's like Ric Flair, my last match. Now he's talking about I want to have another match. Well, we can get somebody to to foot that bill. Uh, Sting was getting about half a million a year back in TNA, uh, and then yeah. he'd retire. And everybody, everybody, bitching about it, and I don't blame him. He's yeah. And what was? Do, do you have a figure on uh, Kurt Angle in TNA? Yeah, I can have a look. One sec. So the best I can find in this short time is that Kurt Angle was making seven figures a year in TNA. So he was making a million plus. That's all we know. Well, I can see now why Awesome Kong and Gail Kim got pissed off over their pay. Mm. Here's a guy, and I want you to think about this, in regular life, he's making TV once every two weeks on a Wednesday. And he's making 10000 a week. So we'd only do two shows in Orlando on a Wednesday, two shows. Oh, we do it on Monday and Tuesday. That's what we do. Hell, he should have been rested up doing all that time. I was doing an interview with Sting one time, and Sting... I think Vance wrote the interviews. He was having trouble with the interview. He couldn't remember it. And I kept trying to say, I'm there while he's going over it. And I said, this and this. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. And I finally said, well, if I don't tell you, you'll never finish this interview. Let me help you here. And he finally got through it. He wanted to do it by himself. Eventually, I just let him do it by himself. We did it about 10 times. He said, why can't I get this? I said, I don't know. He said, no, I think you messed me up. I said, I didn't mess you up. How long have you been in this business? We got in a little bit of an argument. Well, not a little bit. I said, how have you been in this business? Damn near 30 years. You should know how to do this. My God, I'm just still helping you out. If you want me to help you, just tell me. I'll, I'll get somebody else over here. But here I'm trying to help a guy, and he's he's getting mad at me. He's really mad at himself. But don't take it out on me. I'm not your whipping boy today. So then he just beat the shit out of me and I shut up. So. <laughs> I I think this Sting is probably one that of those. Is not, uh, that is not funny, James. When I said he beat the shit out of me, you, 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 find, you found humor in that, didn't you? I did. See? I did. Okay, go ahead. I think Sting is one of those guys where we differ mostly because I really like Sting. I've got a lot of affection for Sting. I was the right age when he came up and 
he's one of the best characters on TV. I know you're not the biggest fan of Sting ever since you've had to deal with him in what eighty five or eighty six, whenever it was when they were when him and Ultimate Warrior was doing that tag team thing. But the one thing I'll say about Sting, because I mean, the, some people level criticisms that he, you know, he needed a lot of help coming up, which you can argue one or two ways. You can say, well, either one, he needed a lot of help, or two, he was a really good listener, and you know, he took direction well. But the other thing is with Sting is, and I think this is a fair criticism, is that he never really seemed to have much depth to his character in the sense that he was always just Sting. You know, you never really got to the, the heart and soul of the character, I suppose. Well, he had some heart and soul when he got to be the crow mm -hmm. and he was coming in. See, that rejuvenated his career. Mm -hmm. He can owe that to Scott Hall. And I've said this before, that he wrestled Flair, Flair got him over, and he gave Flair credit in this farewell speech or his retirement speech. And uh, he he gave all the guys that helped him, he gave them uh, their just dues. So he went with Flair around, and Flair got him over. And then Flair went around with Luger and got him over. <laughs> And the brain trust and WCW said, hey, got a hell of an idea. They sold out with Flair, uh, Sting did, and Luger sold out with Flair. Let's book them against each other. Great idea. So they booked them. <laughs> did it go in the toilet? And they didn't understand it because nobody, you split, you split your crowd. Half of them wanted to see Sting win. Half of them wanted to see Luger win. And then no matter what they did, half their house was pissed off. And you didn't, and they didn't. They drew about a half a crowd for it anyway. And neither were really did. leading the matches either. Like, who was going to yeah, lead no, that match? That's what I'm saying. And But whatever you did, it was going to be a flat finish. Half the people pissed off. Nobody wanted to see it to begin with, or they would be there. See, the people didn't come in saying, oh, I hope I hope he beats the hell out of Luger because they'll still like Luger. Or the Luger fan saying, I hope he beats the hell out of Sting because they still like – they didn't want to see either one of them lose. So when one of them did lose, I forgot what happened, what the finish was, but the half the crowd was pissed off. That's wrestling 101 that I don't know who booked that, but they they learned a lesson there. Uh, I'd like to just justify what I said about Sting before about, you know, never really getting to the heart and, you know, never being, like, too emotional and never, like, having too much depth. I'm talking about someone like Ricky Morton, who, you know, would yep. sell and he would cry in the ring and, or, you know, sweat would be rolling down his eyes, but he looked like he was crying and reaching out to the fans and that kind of thing. Or Ric Flair, who, you know, would get huge, hugely emotional, and, you know, that kind of thing. Whereas Sting was sort of not as three-dimensional as that. He was more the indefatigable, if you like that word. Uh, mm -hmm. I like that word. Yeah, superhero kind of thing where it, he wasn't like a fully fleshed out, uh, f I don't know, like flawed human being that you could relate to in that sense. He was more of a superhero character, especially in The Crow and it, well for, for many years as well. But having said that, I still think Sting was great. He was, he was the best thing at All In when I went to go see All In. Mm -hmm. at Wembley. I still say he was the best thing there. Maybe not the greatest match to most people, but that was the biggest treat was to get to see Sting live for me. Well, good. So you, you left home happy. You went home happy. No, I didn't. So, I had a four-hour drive. I was miserable by the time I got home. I was very tired. We're, we're taking that out. <laughs> at the matches, at the matches, you were happy. Yes, I was. You it was great to see Sting. Okay. So, right. but anyway, but we have characters like that. And what you're saying is it was hard to be emotionally invested in Sting because of the gimmick. Yeah, in the same way that it would be with someone who would be more personable, like uh, a Steve Austin or, as I say, a Ricky Morton or a Tommy Richards, anyone like that, that kind of thing. But you know, See, Ricky, Ricky Morton brought him in. Tommy Rich brought him in because they struggled. And like Ricky Morgan would, would cry and, you know, and his fan base, they suffered with him. See, Sting's fan base knew that he was going to make a comeback somewhere. Mm -hmm. So they were waiting for that. Luger's fan base knew he was going to make a comeback somewhere. 
But even with the Flair fans, when he got a tough, a tough heel, they didn't know if he was going to make a comeback or not. So, but that's one of the things that makes this business unique. Every character is different. Every character has to be treated differently. And unless you do that, uh, you, you're just, you're, you're asking, asking to, you're begging for trouble. You're borrowing trouble and it will come knocking on your door too. Now in the 10, 15 minutes, something like that, we've got left in this podcast. I thought I'd ask you some WCW questions now. For those who don't know, although I'm sure most of you do know the Dutchman's career, he was with the he went to Mid Atlantic in '86, had a tag team with Bobby Jaggers, left a year, excuse me, later, and then in early 1990, you return to the newly formed WCW. You said something about Jim Hurd at the beginning of the episode, but before we get to that, because we'll sort of we may end up just sort of like repeating that story, but. Who first gave you the call or who recommended you to go back to WCW? What was the initial overture? I called myself. I called. I forgot who was who I talked to. Dillon, I think James Dillon, Jim, Jim Dillon. And I think Ole was the booker. So they give me a date. Then they canceled the date. So, and then we went around and around about, I don't know, a couple of weeks over that. And I was getting the run around. And finally, I had actually finished up somewhere else. I think Memphis, maybe. I'd, I'd finished up. And then it didn't look like I was, I, I had the date. It went by. And I called Jim Barnett, my old friend. I knew him years ago. And he would say, Dutch, my boy. <laughs> I love Jim Barnett. He's a great guy. And he said, I don't know the trouble. I don't know the problem. So he said he called me back. I don't know if he called me back or not, but finally I, I called down there and I said, I want you to deliver a message. Oh, I went to see a lawyer. I was in Nashville. I went to see a lawyer and he sent a letter to Jim Hurd saying that if you don't honor, honor a verbal contract, I forgot, I wish I had to save the letter that we we're going to seek uh, legal, legal attention, something like that. Well, and I certified the letter. So he had to sign for it. So I guess his secretary signed for it. He got the letter. He saw it. It was from a lawyer. The lawyer wanted two hundred dollars to write a letter. I said, "I'll give you fifty. I'm not giving you two hundred. He said, "Okay, give me fifty. What is a letter? You know so i but I did get I, I did get their attention when I did that, and then he called me up and he said, "Oh, we're going to start you at the at the I think it was I think Jim Barnett had hired me before, and then it got somehow sidetracked. But when I sent the letter, saying I'm going to sue you for, I forgot what it was. The, the lawyer gave me some legal term. Now it got his attention. And then he called me up and he says, all right, you're going to start here. I said, okay, we could have done this about a month ago and saved us all this trouble. So I started, I think I stayed 18 months or almost two years there. And then I forgot what happened then, but uh, they changed. They, I was doing uh, commentary with Tony Schiavone and going on the road. And what a deal for them. Hmm. I forgot what I was. I, I got a guarantee for those days. It was good. It was good for me. But I was doing also the, uh, the commentary. So they was really getting two for one. And a lot of days I would go out, a lot of weeks, I would leave on a Tuesday, I think, from Atlanta. I'd leave, and I'd go all around the loop. I'd work Tuesday night, Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night. And then I would go to a local airport, wherever I was, on a Monday morning, 
fly back to Atlanta, rent a car, and then go do the commentary and repeat that cycle. I counted one time. I went home during that period one time in 64 days. I told him, I said, guys, I got to go home. I mean, I mean, it's pretty getting human almost. I mean, on the road no, home. it is. It, the guys were going nuts. Everybody was doing this and everybody was going nuts on the road. You're going, you're going stir crazy. That's when I hit the, the loop that the, the first 30 days of that, I was with Sid Vicious and the Iron Sheik. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, too much. Every day with them. Oh, and the sheik was, uh, I got to where I could talk like the sheik. I mean, he's a good guy, but don't get him drinking. <laughs> he's, but this is how I got through all these, all, all these guys that were drinking on the road. They liked me because I was non-confrontational. I was funny. So they all liked me. So if you got to travel with guys like that, get them to like you stay out of the problems. One of my favorite lines is stay in your lane, which I did. And if something happened in the dressing room, I was an observer. I was never a participant unless I had to be. And I saw a lot of things go down it. Well, that's their business. Let them handle it. Anything in particular? Uh, well, I'm trying to think right now. They had a they had a few serious, you know, heat heat segments in the dressing rooms. I think sometimes a guy would come in, scream and holler and throw shit throw shit around, and I just sit over there. I say, well, I move out of the way if he's going to throw something on me. A lot of times the guy that they're mad about is not in the same dressing room. So no need to get involved. But there's there's a few things, but I can't remember any right now other than that fight I had with uh, Roberto Soto. I, I remember that, but I've told that one. Uh, WCW contract, were we talking six figures or were we talking higher five figures for you? Six figures, what do you mean? Well, it was a hundred thousand or more per year. Oh, it was a little. It was a little more than that, but that was good money. That was good. Listen, I, I was coming off a uh, not a run, but everything else was dead. Well, Memphis was dead. Well, that's what I want to ask you. I mean, how much Florida was Jerry paying? Was you? Not much. One one good thing about Memphis, they paid weekly. Very damn mm. weekly. But Florida was dead. Texas was dead. There was no, literally, literally, nowhere to go. You either went to WWF or you went to WCW. ECW, it was just. Didn't exist. It, it existed, but he used he used his own crew. No, no Eastern Championship Wrestling was in 1992. So you you'd left WCW before ECW was ever even a thing, and even and in ninety two it was just bar wrestling pretty uh -huh. much at that point. Well, it was independence is what it was. Mm -hmm. It was independence, and the independents they had that independent attitude. They were just starting out, and they wasn't paying any money. So I needed a regular place to work. So WCW, the only reason I went there is because they gave me a regular check. With that being said, USWA versus WCW, what were the houses in 1990 for each promotion? Well, WCW wasn't, they weren't beating the doors down, but they were paying off TV. They had a different pay scale, a, di a different pay mode. Memphis, uh, oh, the remake of USWA just paid off the house. It was horrible. You could not make a living there. You could not make a living. You, by the time you take your road expenses and the wear and tear on your body and the car, nah, it's not worth it. And I don't think they were running five days a week. I think they were running like four. It, it was a mess. Let me say that. Uh, you were better off not going. We'll do. 
We'll probably review your very first match televised with WCW, and then we'll call it there. Uh, the first match I can find that you had in WCW as WCW was against Italian Stallion, a uh, name that I am associate just as much with bringing jobbers to TV as being a wrestler. You say what now? You uh, Italian uh, Italian Stallion. He was one of the guys who used to bring in jobbers for you know yep. TV for WCW and WWF at the time. Mm-hmm. Any stories yep. on Italian Stallion? Not really. He was just one of the guys that they gave him a different name instead of just job job guys. They called him Enhancement Talent, and they were there to just put over the regulars. And I went there first, and they put me over couple of weeks then i became like a regular <laughs> guy you could beat so but i was i was i was up there in age anyway so then nothing i don't blame them for what they did they finally honored their end of it i honored mine and there was no problem other than they then they just run me to death but they ran everybody to death right then let's <clears throat> review your very first match in WCW, and one sec. Okay, and here we go. <laughs> Wet, that's loud. <laughs> Paul Drake. Introducing to my right from Do you remember this? Wisconsin, Do you remember that guy? Pounds, Who's that guy? Paul Drake. Drake. Never heard of him. His opponent from Oil Trough, Texas, weighing 200. Looks like he was swimming in Oil Trough, Texas, pounds, that guy. Dirty, Very greasy boy. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. What a handsome fella I was. Ruggedly handsome. Ruggedly handsome. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? Yeah, that's, that's JR talking about me. be categorized as ruggedly handsome in some estimation, or just downright dirty, Dutch, and ugly. He is a bad hombre. I've known him for quite some time. Jim Cornette's also doing the commentary for you. Now, when was this match? 1990. March or April, I think. I can't remember. And I do not really remember this match. I never, I, I, if I saw this guy today when he said this, I have no recollection of this. The commentary so, team, I, I listen to the commentary rather than watching it, is uh, they do spend an awful lot of time talking about the debut of Robocop. Yeah, you know, that's what they, that's what, this is a filler match. When, when you were brought in, was there any chats about you basically saying, "Look, you're going to be a filler match guy in WCW," or were you promised more than what you got, or did you even no. have a chat? You were just booked, and that was that. I was just booked. You know, if they wanted to do something, they could do something. And I'm, I may have thrown a few ideas at them, but they had to, they had the Lugers and the Stings and. The, and the flares, they had enough problems on their hands with those guys and for me trying to get in, get in their ear. Yeah, do you oh, wanna... this, is when they, this is when they had that 900 hotline. 1-900-909-9900, two dollars first minute, 45 cents each additional minute, kids get parents approval. Which I, <laughs> what kid would ever get a parents approval for that? That's oh, right. No. Bring him right up. Do you know, we... <clears throat> The ruggedly handsome again, Cornette just said. You know, obviously people talk about your moustache as a prominent feature of you, but I don't think people talk about your strong mullet game in the early 90s. No, it was it was pretty pretty strong out there. <laughs> See, they talk about my moustache. They don't talk about my beard because it's, it's a regular beard, but they do talk about the moustache and the hair on me. So... There you go. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a, a very hassoot. Is that the word, hassoot, Harry? Hassoot. Yeah. Do you know, funnily enough, I was watching a match the other day with Miguel Perez Jr. And I was he's thinking, hairy, too. I was thinking, who's hairy, you or him? Uh, I think he's he might be a little bit hairier than me. Oh, yeah. Come on, Dutch. Beat the crap out of him. <laughs> I, 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 I don't even know who wins this match. I hope I do. No, you do. I mean, no one's heard of this guy. Well, that don't mean nothing. We could have been trying. They, they could have got a hair up their butt and said, oh, we're going to push this Frank Drake guy. He's a... Uh, <laughs> what am I doing here? Oh, my God. He kicked the crap out of me. Boom, boom. 
you see a lot of times when your guy's gonna when a guy's gonna uh, there you go dutch good i was like when you're gonna beat a guy when you're gonna beat a guy i always learned this when i first started make him look like he belongs in the same ring with you great short clothesline that you stole off jake roberts right yeah that's what they say there it is he said i stole it off uh i don't know where i got that from i think i just invented it one day in the ring no well then i got to, then i got to texas and then jake the snake took it after i had a match with him and he did do it great did did it very well so i don't remember that match i remember the crowd and i remember uh, who's is that was uh what was the name of that referee oh I've just patrick oh, was it was nick patrick yeah nick patrick and now he's jody hamilton's son right mm -hmm. okay good guy what about star rating for that match oh a star rating for that match that would be about one and a half mm -hmm. two maybe uh, i think so we'll... you rate you rate that match by the number of screw-ups and they weren't many there's probably a few but I Not think, too bad. I think on that note, we're going to shut it down. I've got a ton more. I mean, how many more WCW questions have we got for crime and his sake? Another two pages worth, or another page and a half at least. So we've got plenty to go about for the next episode and the next couple of episodes. So, I mean, barring, you know, another big old weekly news story, of course, because... Uh, okay, just, let me so ask you a question news. before we leave. Oh, yeah. CM Punk, did we talk about this last week? It's not going to WWE, correct? We, we did. We did talk about we that. But about I, I'm not sure I buy that, to be honest. Because... I don't buy it either. Because they don't need him right now. But that's not to say they won't need him in February. Remember, some guys can get hurt. And that's when they look for guys to fill in without changing the whole card. If they had to reach back on a card and pull somebody up to fit a position, well, that upsets their whole card. They'd rather reach outside the company, get somebody, pull them in for this spot, and then go from there. I think that's where we're at. I think I, 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 I've got a conspiracy theory for you. I think WWE has fed Dave Meltzer false information, and he might actually still debut in Survivor Series this year. You think so? I think so because I've I know for a fact that WWE a couple of times has fed him the false information on purpose, yes. knowing that he will disseminate it and then everyone will crib off his uh, report. So really? I'm 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 thinking that this might be one of those times where he actually will debut in Chicago. Well, I thought he was kind of. I thought he was kind of messy. Let's talk about AEW. I thought he was kind of pissed at AEW. And then last week he comes out like, am I correct in this? He changes his whole tune and is super, super overly friendly with them. I think, the, that I think the problem is, and we talked about Meltzer a lot this week, but the problem is, is that he's got a direct line and he's, di and he's personal friends with Tony Khan. So mm -hmm. you just, you cannot be, completely objective when one you rate all matches so you're a journalist and a critic which sort of doesn't quite go hand in hand as as, as maybe people think it should but similarly uh, you know he's uh, I'm, the old saying he's on first name tone uh, yeah. first name terms with tony but he calls him and texts him all the time and they get advice off each other and stuff like that and it's like he doesn't do that with vince or not anymore at least not for at least 20 years no, so, I don't think he ever. I don't think he ever did it with Vince. Apparently, he did for a couple of times. He and, he may have had a few times, and that's it. So, but but, I don't, but but Tony, I don't know what Tony is. is he a boss? Is he a friend? Is he? Uh, uh, I don't know what he is. But I'm sure some of the people that put up those botches on the line, I bet he's not friends with them. No, so. I don't know. Well, he I, th I think he, he's going to have to step up and be a boss one day. And let's see when that day comes. Well, it wasn't on the Dynamite Rampage tapings this Wednesday because Mystico, if uh, you know that name, the uh, the original yeah. Sin Cara, yeah. 
made his debut, I think, for Rampage. And then after the match, Tony Khan ran down and gave him a hug. On camera or no? I think it was on camera. It was either on camera. I think it was in the arena. So mm-hmm. wh- whether it makes the Rampage taping or if it's just off fan phones, I don't know. But it's like, if you, if you must hug your wrestlers, just do it in the back. <laughs> Yeah, do that in private, please. <laughs> now, I've seen uh, Vince is very, very, Vince McMahon is very private, really. Hmm. And he would hug guys, but he'd always do it at the griddle position. And it's after they went 30 minutes and just burned the house down. He would give them a big, I've seen him hug Undertaker because he likes Undertaker anyway. And I've seen him do Brock, and I've seen him do Triple H, mm-hmm. and Shawn Michaels. He's he, he's done a lot of those guys. So when Vince hugs you, then you know it's because you did a hell of a good job. When Tony hugs you, you don't know where it's coming from. He might it be could be coming, it, maybe, or it could be coming from friendship, or just glad you're there, or whatever. He said, "Oh, I'm glad you're here. Here's here's ten grand or something, <laughs> and just give it to him and, and let him go." But I've seen Vince do it, but not very often. So I think the Undertaker's last match. Where where was that from? You remember? Oh, his last match was uh, that made for TV movie thing at one of the WrestleManias a couple of years ago. No, this was what? No, well, maybe. But he had a match. I think it was Brock. Brock. I think where was that? Houston. Oh, God. Not the one where he lost, was it? At WrestleMania? Where he lost. Yeah. Yeah, that was at 30, so that was New Orleans. New Orleans. Hugged in there, big hug. But he kind of he kind of deserved it because the fans, they were really, really invested in that match. And the looks on their faces showed you that how surprised they were. See, that's a record that when I kept hearing about it, okay, what was he, 28 and 0? Yeah, 20, what was 21 and 0, I think. Oh, 21 and 0. But anyway, at a, these were WrestleManias, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Nobody thought that would ever be broken. And then it got broken. And remember, the guy stood up with his mouth open like, what the hell did we just see? That's the beauty in wrestling. Because I was looking around the dressing room, and I didn't know the finish. And everybody was sitting around like, what the hell? And that is great. When you can when you can fool a whole dressing room because they made sure this did not get out. And when you can fool a whole dressing room where the dressing room is saying, hmm, didn't see that coming. See, everybody thought Undertaker would beat would beat Brock, but he didn't which was good for business. So an undertaker, he don't give a crap one way or the other, just pay him whatever he's got coming and let him go. So, and him and Vince are good buddies anyway. So I think taker felt need to feel obligated, but business wise. Yeah. I'm gonna make this a hell of a match and put him over. And he deserved a hug after that. Let me tell you, right. I'm going to shut down this podcast because if nothing else, I really need a piss. So thank you very much for watching. We'll catch you again on Tuesday. You need a what? A, a, a big, Big horse piss. I really, really have got a full bladder at the moment for about an hour now. I was too polite to pause the podcast to go and have one. Okay, okay. So well, go and take take your little tinkle. Yeah, I'll give me a second. Let's let's do the thing. All right. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. Uh, we'll be back on Tuesday answering your fan questions. You can submit your question to questions for Dutch at gmail dot com. As we said at the beginning, we've got books, we've got diplomas. We've got T-shirts somewhere as well. You know, all links are in the description if you want to support this show and get some merchandise at the same time. But for now, thank you very much, Dutch. We the people. We the people.